Bonjour, hello everybody. Um, today's Lindy DNet is hosted by um, the IUSSP. Um, welcome to everyone who's joining virtually or in person. Um, this, uh, the IUSSP is the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population for those who might not know who we are. I'm Mary Ellen Zupin, the IUSSP Executive Director. Um, that, the union, as it's known here, is a global association. Oops, pardon. Um, is a global association of with over 1,800 members from approximately 140 countries, um, for individuals interested in population studies. Its members include population scientists and professionals from diverse disciplines and backgrounds. IUSSP organizes seminars, webinars, training activities, and um, has some fellowship projects. The activities are proposed and driven by members who work through IUSSP scientific panels. Every four years, the IUSSP also organizes the International Population Conference. And I want to remind everybody that the next International Population Conference will um, take place in Brisbane, Australia, the week of 13 to 18 July, 2025. The call for papers has been announced. And you're all invited to consult the list of themes and member organized session topics by visiting the IUSSP conference website. The deadline to submit abstracts is 15 September 2024. And I wanted to mention that before we turn to our speaker. Um, IUSSP is hosted um, at ENED, where the IUSSP secretary is based. And each year, ENED invites IUSSP to feature an IUSSP council member, scientific panel member, or IUSSP members research by hosting a Lundy DNED. So this is our day today. <laughs> um, this year, ISP has invited Dr. Elizabeth Sully to be the featured speaker. Um, Beth Sully is a principal research scientist at the Guttmacher Institute, where she has exper expertise in both quantitative and qualitative research. Her research focuses on family planning measurement, abortion, adolescent sexual and reproductive health, and assessing the cost and benefits of sexual and reproductive health services. She serves on the editorial committee for studies in family planning and is a member of the FP 2030 performance and monitoring and evidence, and evidence working group. Um, she's also co-chair of a new IUSSP scientific panel on rethinking global plan family planning measurement and reproductive with a reproductive rights and justice lens, which recently organized um, several webinars and an expert group meeting in Kenya just last week, and we'll be reporting on that soon on the ISP website. Um, Beth has recently relocated with her family to Paris, where she'll continue to work for the Guttmacher Institute. Um, from a distance. This Lundy to Ened is an opportunity for her to, introdu to introduce Beth to Ened and for her to present new research she and her team at Guttmacher will be conducting on the, to assess the impact of the overturn of Roe versus Wade, which allowed, made abortion legal in the United States by the US Supreme Court in June of 2020. They're looking at the impact of the overturn of that, um, that legislation on the health of pregnant persons at the state level in the United States, where restrictions on the access to abortion vary widely from state to state. Mm -hmm. um, and today's discussant, Valentin Becke of Ined, um, has prepared comments for the discussion, but because she was um, unable to present today, Geraldine Dutte, who is um, on IUSSP on the ISP Council, is, um, has graciously volunteered to present Valentine's comments. Okay, and I'll be timing this, and I'll turn this over to Elizabeth, who has approximately 30 minutes. Thank you, Mary Ellen. It's nice to be here today and to get to meet some of the other folks at Edinet. I'm quite new to Paris. Just two months ago, we moved here, so I'm really happy to make it up here, but I've known about Edinet and work coming out here for a long time. Um, so I've, I'm a, senior, a principal research scientist at the Guttmacher Institute. For those not familiar, the Guttmacher Institute is a leading sexual and reproductive rights organization doing both research and policy work. We're based in the U.S. and about half of our work is in the U.S. and half is global. And so I'm going to be talking a bit about how we've been bringing our global and U.S. research expertise together to really think about how to measure changes in abortion and the impact of abortion restrictions in the U.S. and the, with the recent overturning of the abortion laws. 
um, my background is actually in global abortion measurement. So I've done a lot of work trying to measure abortion in restrictive settings, testing new indirect estimation approaches. And so this work I'm going to present is me coming together with my colleagues that are U.S. abortion research experts and trying to think about our experiences and lessons learned from both contexts. So this is part of a new study that's funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US. Um, and it's a five-year program of work. We're in year one. So what I'm going to talk about is sort of our plans for what's coming, but also sort of what we're learning in our first pilot year of, of this program of work. And we've got two main aims. One is in the short term to measure the impact of new state abortion restrictions as they come in, to measure what the impact of those restrictions are on the health of pregnant people in the US. And then in the longer term, to set up a new infrastructure for how do we measure abortion incidents going forward. And I'll talk about Guttmacher's history and our role in measuring abortion incidents over time um, and thinking about how to measure abortion incidents in a country that's really bifurcated into some contexts where it is still legal and access is growing and other contexts where it's extremely restricted and not accessible at all and taking place outside of the formal health system in a lot of ways and how, how to be able to measure both of those pieces together. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the changing landscape of abortion in the U.S. I'll give a video, which hopefully gives it's a short one minute video, but some background, especially you all probably don't follow state policies in the U.S. very closely. Um, so I'll give a little background on that. And then I'll talk about the work we've been doing, trying to measure abortion within the formal health system after the change in the abortion law in the U.S. and then measuring abortion outside of the formal health system and how we're thinking about putting those two pieces together going forward. So before I play the video, I'll just mention, so in June of 2022, there was a Supreme Court decision in the US called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. And we call it Dobbs for shorthand. And that was the overturning of the Roe v. Wade decision, which was from 1973, which had set up the legal right to abortion in the US. Dobbs basically, remove the federal right and send it back to the state level. And so what that has meant is everything is being decided across states and in different ways. And there's a whole myriad of different types of restrictions at different gestational ages, different regulations on provision of care, as well as states that have tried to improve access to care over this period. So it's been a lot of understanding abortion in the US right now is understanding variation state by state and what's happening. I think for those on Zoom, I don't know if the sound will come you a sense of how many new restrictions came in and then the states going more in blue are states that put in measures to protect abortion access after the Dobbs decision. So we run at Guttmacher a state policy map and so we track all proposed and passed legislation in all states in the U.S. and update this map periodically as changes take place in different states abortion legislation. Since the video which was released nine months ago Two additional states, South Carolina and Indiana, passed bans, so it's now 15 states that have a ban, and there's one currently held up in the Florida Supreme Court, um, the state Supreme Court, and so we're waiting on a decision since September, any day now, and it's a proposed six-week ban. So this gives you a sense of what it looks like in the U.S. right now across states, and I put a little QR code there so you can see sort of the variation by state and what those restrictions look like.
So let me go to talking about um, how, to, how we measure abortion within the formal healthcare system. So Guttmacher has been measuring the incidence of abortion in the United States for half a century. The first census of abortion providers that Guttmacher conducted was in 1974, the year after Roe v. Wade when abortion became legal in the US. And since then, we've done a census of abortion providers every three years. And these are typically considered the most complete counts of abortion in the US. And they're critical data for researchers and policymakers and it really helps frame the context of abortion in the US. We don't have official health statistics like a lot of other countries would. Every state can choose whether or not to report their case abortion counts to the CDC. Some states do, but they're incomplete and some states don't at all. So the CDC's data, Center for Disease Control, is actually missing a number of states that have a large share of abortion. So people turn to Guttmacher as the source of abortion counts in the US. What we've seen through these abortion provider censuses that we do every three years is that abortions rose following the legalization of abortion in 1973, and then really have been declining quite steadily until about 20, in the last decade, we've seen an increase in the abortion rate again in the United States. It's been slowly going up. But through this history of measuring abortion and running these abortion provider censuses, we really come to understand how hard it can be to measure abortion in the US context. And it's only gotten harder. So for one thing, we need more timely data. Before we've only had annual estimates of abortion incidents, but with these state restrictions coming in, things are changing month to month and what access looks like, and we need more timely data to understand that. So more timely data that we get faster and on smaller time scales. And we also need to lessen the burden on abortion providers and support staff. So when we do an abortion provider census, we ask every facility providing abortion in the US to report caseloads to us and that takes work. And so if we're wanting more timely data faster and month by month, we need to also think about the burden that places on health facilities. And then we also need to account for abortions taking place outside of the US health system. So I'm gonna, in sort of the second part of this talk, share what we're doing to think about how to measure that piece. So I'm just gonna start by just talking about measuring what's taking place in health facilities. So I'm gonna talk about new work that we've started um, to, to meet this evolving need. It's led by my colleague, Isaac Maddow-Zimmett, and I've listed here other colleagues at the Guttmacher Institute who are working on this project with us. When I talk about abortion in the healthcare system, that includes medication abortion and surgical abortion, as well as a growth of telehealth provision of abortion. So the, the, the FDA that regulates abortion medications in the US changed the regulations on mifepristone in 2016 that allowed for telehealth distribution. So there's been a big increase since 2016 in telehealth care as well, and that's part of the formal health provision. So in March of last year, we launched the monthly abortion provision study, and its goal is to produce monthly publicly available estimates of state level abortion incidents while trying to minimize the burden on facilities in collecting this data. So we do this by recruiting monthly samples of abortion providers, and we ask four key questions. The number of abortions provided by month, the patient's state of residence, gestational age, and then we have one rotating question that changes month to month based on sort of what the state or national policy need is. And so we've, since March, been fielding a different question each month that goes out with the survey. If you're interested, I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty of, of the model itself, um, but if you're interested, we have the whole model published up on Open Science Framework. Um, but generally what we're doing is we're taking our wealth of historical facility level data and then combining that into a Bayesian model to produce iteratively updated national and state estimates. So we're taking our wealth of historical data, the monthly samples and new data coming in, putting it into a Bayesian model and estimating for our missing facility data. So a bit about how our, our sample works. Um, so this graphic represents roughly every abortion facility in the US. It's not precise, but it's also not far off from what that might look like. And we have two arms of our data collection. One is a purposive arm, so that's the blue ones on the left, and these are facilities that we interview every month to get their data. And these are often things like Planned Parenthood facilities or independent clinics that we know provide the majority of abortions in their state. 
There are some states where there might be only one remaining abortion provider, and we include them in our sample every month because we know how critical they are to understanding abortion in that state. So we collect data from them every month, and then we have a random sample where we sample 100 facilities and ask for data, not just for that month, but also for all prior months. So we do that, we did that in March, we did it again in April, sampling with replacement, and then continued each month. And a really nice feature is because we're collecting data from prior months for facility samples, as we go on, we accumulate more and more data from the earlier months, and our model starts to perform better, we get more precise estimates. So each month we actually, when we release new data, we also release updated estimates for all of the prior months as well as the model performs better. So let me talk a bit about what we found so far. Um, and talk about the impact of recent state bans that have come into effect just since we started data collection. So first off, in North Carolina in July, they passed a bill, SB 20, so SB stands for state bill, state bill 20, that was their abortion restriction at 12 weeks. And we found that after that bill went in, there was a 31% drop in abortions provided in the formal health care sector in, in that state. And that drop was sustained through August and onwards. So it wasn't just sort of an isolated shock when, when the bill came in. Um, and a 12-week ban we know has impacts on people seeking abortions at later gestations, but more importantly, the ban had other provisions on the regulation of abortion care. So it required 72 hours waiting period. So the patient had to come in, be counseled by a provider, wait 72 hours, and then come back. And because there are a lot of people who are traveling from states with bans to a state like North Carolina for access, that can become a burden that's just too hard to overcome. It means you have to stay for an additional period of time or make two trips to the state in order to get the abortion. And it burdens the facilities because all of a sudden you're doubling the number of visits that are needed to provide every, every abortion case. South Carolina passed a ban in August that went into effect. And what we've seen previously with six week bans is that there was about a 50% decline in the abortions in the state. But in South Carolina, when they had their six-week ban come in, we actually saw a larger drop down to 79%. And what we think we're seeing is as more bans come in, certain states are serving more and more of the patients who are able to travel. And so we're seeing greater impacts of each additional ban that's coming in because it's, it's sort of additive on top of all the other state bans that have come in. And just to, to mention again, you know, this is really talking about abortions in the formal healthcare sector. So when we see these declines, we don't know how many of those people went on to still have abortions, but self-manage their abortions, whether they managed to go to another state to get those abortions. So we, we don't see increases in other states that would suggest that. Um, and we don't know how many people were then forced to continue the pregnancy and gave birth. And there's been some work by Dr. Caitlin Myers that showed in states where there are bans, we've seen increases in births as a result after the Dobbs decision. So what we've done is we've taken the first six months of 2023 that we have data for and compared that to a six month period for 2020, the last time that we did this abortion provider census to see sort of how different are, is what we're seeing in 2023 compared to 2020. And so this graph shows you each little shape as a state and blue indicates that they've seen an increase in the number of abortions in the first half of 2023 compared to 2020. And so overall we're seeing really big increases, but some of the darkest blue are those that border states with restrictions. So we're seeing the greatest increases in states that border, but we also see increases in states that don't border any states with bans. So you see sort of you know, you've got Vermont and New Hampshire and a bunch on the upper right for those who don't know their state geography. I'm, I'm Canadian and I've had to learn all of my U.S. states, so <laughs> I get it. Um, but a lot, you know, if you look in the cluster in the nor upper northeast, those aren't bordering any banned states, but they're also all seeing increases. And this could be a combination of the trend was already going up. Abortion incidence was increasing in the U.S. before the restrictions came in. It could be that as these states have expanded access to meet the needs of other states, more people in their state have also been able to access care. And so we think there's a bunch of factors sort of all taking place together. But it also leaves us with some questions. So how much of this increase is due to travel from out of state? Where are people traveling and going to to get care? 
And how has the landscape of travel for care shifted since 2020, when we last had data available on people traveling for care in different states? So I think to answer these questions, just to give a little bit of context, in 2020, we knew that one in 10 people who obtained an abortion in the US traveled across state lines to do so. There were already restrictions in place in states. They weren't banned, but there were restrictions on care. Or sometimes if you lived in a state, it, was, it took you longer to travel to a clinic in your state than maybe to a clinic in a border state. So travel has already been a part of the abortion care provision in the US for quite a while. And people traveled for, for a variety of reasons, whether it was they were forced to because of restrictions or it was just easier to travel. Um, and we think that increases in travel from 2020 are likely due to bans. 2020, even though that was COVID, wasn't actually that different a year in terms of travel. We have some data from 2019 and from 2021, and travel is quite stable across all three years. Um, and so, and there hasn't been a lot of, that would have changed that would influence travel aside from bans and closures in clinics over that period. Um, and so, just to mention, I'm going to talk about again comparing the first half of 2023, but we've had more bans since then. So this has also shifted and changed since this this data was analyzed. So here you can see the proportion of patients traveling across state lines and as well as the total number from 2020 to 2023. So we see nearly a doubling of the proportion of patients that travel to receive care, going from 9% to 17%. And that represents about a 50,000 increase in the number of people who traveled for care from 2020 to 2023. This shows you the picture by state. So here on the left, you have states that are border states to states that have total abortion bans. So these are states that we think should be receiving more patients coming and traveling to their state just based on geographic proximity. And on the right, you have all other states, and then both of them show the national average increase in that blue line, the nine to the 17% is the national total. And so you see, you know, the, the steeper lines going up are more so in the border states. That's where we're seeing the largest increases in the proportion of abortion cases in that state that are from patients coming from out of state. So just to go through a couple examples to give a sense of that, if we look at New Mexico first, we see that New Mexico went from 38% of abortion patients in New Mexico coming from another state to 74%. So three quarters of abortion cases being provided in that state are for patients for coming from out of state. What that represents is an increase from 1,100 patients coming from out of state to 8,200 patients, which is an increase of just over 7,000 patients that needed to travel to New Mexico for care. Comparing this to the overall increase in New Mexico, New Mexico saw an increase of 8,200 abortions. So we can see that 87% of the increase in abortion cases in, Mex in New Mexico were made up of abortion patients traveling from out of state. If we compare that to Illinois, Illinois has long been uh, sort of geographically an important point of abortion access. And we see it's still an increase, a near a doubling from 21 to 42% of abortion patients in Illinois coming from another state. So that's in terms of, of absolute numbers going from 5,600 to 18,900. There's an increase of 13,300 people coming from out of state. If you compare that to the change overall in the state, there was an increase in 18,700 more abortions in the first half of 2023 compared to half of 2020. That's about 71% of the increase. And so that tells us, you know, abortion patients traveling from out of state represent a sizable share, but there's still a 30% increase in patients in the state of Illinois getting abortions in that state. So it suggests that maybe this expansion of access, the increase of telehealth, protective laws, have also made abortions more accessible to people in states where it's not been banned. So what's next? We're unfortunately, the timing of, of today's talk was a little unfortunate because we have new data that will be for all of 2023 that is embargoed until midnight tonight. And so I wasn't allowed to show it, um, but I put the QR code, but we're gonna release all of incidence rates for all of 2023 that will come out tonight by state of occurrence and state of residence. And we're also gonna update the proportion of abortions provided with medication abortion in the US, which is particularly important because there's a case in front of the Supreme Court right now 
around um, the regulations and approval for mifepristone. And there is concern that access to mifepristone could, um, could be greatly affected by that decision, depending on how the Supreme Court rules. And we know that medication abortions make up a growing and important share of all abortions in the US right now. Um, and then over this next year, we're gonna start looking at the gestational duration data and really trying to understand how some of these shifts and in increases in patient volumes and states might be impacting the gestational ages at which people obtain care. So let me switch to then talking about how we're thinking about measuring abortion outside of the formal health care system. And I'm going to refer to this as self-managed abortion, and I'll define what that is. Um, I just want to acknowledge this is work that I'm doing with co-authors co at the Guttmacher Institute, as well as Dr. Aiken and Dr. Scott, who are at the University of Texas at Austin. So self-managed abortion, for those not familiar with the term, is when a person obtains an abortion outside of the formal health care system. And so this could be from an unlicensed source, like a community support network or a website that's selling pills. It could also be from an out-of-state medical provider in a state where abortion is banned. And we could talk about this in the Q&A if you're interested, but it's, I think, an evolving and complex legal landscape where some states are passing laws that are, were called shield laws to protect the providers in their state, and it's saying they'll protect them for providing abortions to patients in banned states. And so it's raising a lot of questions of legal jurisdiction in the US, um, but it's been a way of trying to expand access and have telemedicine reach people in banned states right now. Um, and people could also self-procure abortion pills, they could cross the border, they might get them through informal networks. So there's a range of ways that might happen. And we can think about self-managed abortion as safe self-managed abortion using mifepristone and misoprostol or misoprostol only, but it also includes less safe methods that someone might choose to use like plants, herbs, ingesting toxic substances, intrauterine trauma, physical trauma, alcohol and drug abuse, and a range of other sort of what we think of when people think of unsafe abortion methods. It's important to note that self-managed medication abortion, so using mifepristone and misoprostol, has been proven to be safe and effective. And in fact, the WHO has, has made clear that that self-managed medication abortion can be considered safe abortion. So they say, in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, a medical abortion can also be safely self-managed by a pregnant person outside of a healthcare facility, for example, at home, in whole or in part. It requires that a woman, girl, or other pregnant person has access to accurate information, to quality medicine, and to support from a trained health worker if they need or want it during that process. So this comes from the 2022 Safe Abortion Care Guidelines and Updates that the WHO has just released. And I think I'm going to come back to the last part of that definition of access to a health worker if they want or need it, because that's part of what we're starting to look at and trying to understand is how many people who want to or are forced to self-manage their abortions and have them outside of the health system in the US still want access to health professionals and care? And what does that look like? And what are the gaps and challenges? Um, and also, how can we use that to help us estimate abortion incidents? So I'm going to talk about how to estimate self-managed abortion and talk a little bit about some different approaches and then what we're doing to our, our approach that we're going to be taking through this grant over the next five years to try to do that. So I don't need to explain to demographers why self-reported data can be problematic and difficult for hidden behaviors and stigma, hidden populations and stigmatized behaviors. We know that people are reluctant to report it and we're not going to necessarily get reliable estimates through direct surveys. That said, there's been some work um, by Ralph and colleagues in 2020 where they did a nationally representative survey and they asked people about the lifetime experience of self-managing an abortion. Um, and they found that 1.4% of participants reported a history of attempting to self-manage an abortion in the US. This was before the Dobbs decision, before these restrictions came in, but also this is lifetime incidents, which is really hard to understand or know what that means or it's not, not very useful data sometimes. Um, and it's also whether they ever attempted. So we don't know if they actually had an abortion. We just know that they attempted. And often when we're trying to measure self-managed abortion globally in restrictive context, we ask about successful attempts because we know an abortion isn't just sometimes one event, but it's a series of attempts or behaviors or using different methods 
to try to, to have an abortion. But we know from research in the US that the completeness of direct reporting of abortion is poor. So this was work done by Dr. Lindbergh and, and colleagues at the Guttmacher Institute. And they looked across three different national surveys in the US, as well as two different survey modalities in one survey. And this shows the completeness of direct reporting of abortion. So this is before the Dobbs decision, when abortion was legal, we still see across surveys sort of somewhere from 72 to 29% of abortions are actually getting reported in self-reports. And I think there's a lot to be done to think about how we can improve direct reporting. I don't think we should throw it out and forget it entirely, but it remains, I think, a, a challenge to, uh, in abortion research to figure out how to get people to report their abortions better. And there's lots we could think about around question order, method of administration, framing, consistency, interviewer effects. And there's a lot of new research in this area that's been coming out that I think is going to help improve this, but we're not quite there yet. And um, Laura Lindbergh, who I mentioned, did the work with Guttmacher colleagues on the previous research on abortion underreporting. They did cognitive interviews, and then they experimentally tested a bunch of different ways to try to improve abortion reporting in the U.S., and nothing worked. So they looked at question order and context and framing and sort of the sensitivity of the questions and they couldn't find anything that led to improved reports. So I've got here a table of a range of different indirect methods that have been used to measure abortion in the global context. Um, and the first one here is called the abortion incidence complications method. And in some ways we think of it as the gold standard. It has a lot of, of challenges, but it's been used in over 26 countries and it sort of remains kind of the best we've got is how we sometimes think about it. Um, so I'll walk through that and then I'll come back to this table and, and just briefly talk about some of the other ones. Okay, five. All right. So then I'll go quick through this. So the abortion incidence complications method, and I'll explain why there's a hippo on the slide in a second, is it's a, it's a version of the multiplier method in epidemiology. So there's some portion of the population you can observe, and then there's a portion that still remains hidden. And so the idea is you get an estimate of what you can observe, and then a multiplier that tells you for every one person you see how many other are there. So when this is used, we think of it as an iceberg, but we've been told by colleagues in low and middle income countries, that's not a useful analogy. They don't have many icebergs, but the hippo is the better analogy. The head's above the water and you can't see the body below the surface. So the tip of the, the hippo head, what we can see, we measure that through health facility surveys and we look at people who have complications from abortion and we estimate national caseloads of post-abortion care. And then we interview key informants, people who know a lot about abortion in those contexts, to get an estimate of how many other people there are for every one person we see getting post-abortion care, how many others might have complications but don't get treatment for them or don't have any complications from an abortion. The method though has been increasingly criticized in recent years because of growing access to medication abortion. It just means that abortions are more safe, that we're not seeing the same type of complications or levels of complications that we did 20 years ago or 15 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so it's not necessarily as reliable when that tip of the, the hippo's head gets smaller and smaller, then you're relying on a greater share of your incidence being estimated through the multiplier. It, it, there's questions around the reliability and precision of that estimate then. There's been some attempts to improve, improve on this method in recent years um, that have either been sort of not so successful or there's work underway in Kenya trying to see if they can do a respondent driven sample of people who've had abortions to get an estimate of that multiplier and whether that's an improvement on the method. There's sort of this other bucket of indirect methods that have been tested. The LIST experiment is one that sort of has had success in some contexts and not in others. The idea is sort of there's a range of method, there's a, a range of behaviors or health experiences and you're asked how many of them you've experienced. So you don't have to tell someone you had an abortion, you just say three of the five and maybe one of those three is an abortion. Um, but it, it's had mixed success. And then there's a range of social network based methods where we try to get people to report on their friends, their confidants or their whole social network. Um, and I've done some work in this area and happy to talk about it, but so far we keep dealing with issues of biases in our numerator and our denominator. And so we don't think it's very reliable going forward at this point. 
So for the U.S. context, what we want to do is adapt the abortion incidence complications method specifically to try to measure medication abortion. And so we want to do this by not trying to focus on complications anymore, but just think about treatment seeking, that people still may come to a health facility for any form of care, and can we pick up any type of treatment seeking, not just complications. And we're going to do this through trying to study, in the, in the U.S., they say miscarriage management care. So that includes care for abortions as well as miscarriages. And so looking at health administrative data to try to see if we can estimate the share of miscarriage management cases that are likely due to abortion after Dobbs. And then doing surveys of people self-managing their abortions themselves, as well as people who are providing self-managed abortion services to see if we can get a multiplier that way. So we're sort of switching this treatment-seeking multiplier, moving away from complications because we know that self-managed abortions have gotten safer to try to estimate the multiplier directly from people who are self-managing their abortions and using health administrative data with trends on miscarriage care to see if we can pick up sort of what the increase in care seeking is after the bans have come into effect. So we're still in year one. This is like a, a five-year agenda of work right there that we're working towards. Um, but we've been doing a pilot this year of people self-managing their abortions in Florida, Indiana, and Louisiana. We got data in Indiana before and after a ban. Florida, we've been collecting pre-ban data, and we've paused data collection, and we'll start again when the likely ban, we, we don't know how the court will rule, but it, people seem to think it is likely that it will come into effect, and we'll restart data collection in that case. What we did is we recruited through providers who are offering these services. There's a website called, called Plan C where you can go and see the different providers um, and they've generally ordered pills from these companies and have tested that they're in fact the correct medication. So there's some guarantee that way and they tell you the cost and how long it will take to come. So we've been working with top providers and recruiting people uh, into our survey and they send out access codes. So every one of their clients gets an email with an access code to then come and complete our survey. So then we know how many access codes have gone out, which is I think really important because sometimes you, you get responses but you don't know what the underlying population is. So there were over 2000 access codes sent out and we have 160 respondents to our pilot, so about a 7.8% response rate. Um, we think, yeah, I gotta go really quick. <laughs> um, let me just go to talking a little bit about the demographics of our sample. So for the most part, they're more likely to be older than 20 years of age, without a college degree, born in the U.S., about just 60% have, have a child already, 50% black, um, and the majority heterosexual or straight. When we compare this to what we know about the overall population of people having abortions in the U.S. before the, the Dobbs decision came in, our sample is generally younger more likely to be black and more likely not to have a college degree. And so I think that sort of suggests it could be that groups that are more structurally marginalized, that have the hardest time traveling to seek care, are those who might be turning to self-managed abortion. But it could also be that these are people who don't want to engage as much with the formal health care system, are more discriminated by providers, and might prefer a means of having an abortion on their own. We found about 38% of users reported some form of treatment seeking. I'm gonna go really quick because I know I'm at time. <laughs> but interestingly, the majority sought treatment to confirm they were no longer pregnant. Only 3% had to seek treatment because they needed removal of retained products of conception, so they had an incomplete abortion. Some had concerns about symptoms, about 30%, but really the majority were just wanting to confirm that the abortion worked, that they were no longer pregnant. But 12% said that they were unable to seek care, and most of that was either due to financial reasons or because they were concerned they had legal fears about going and seeking care and someone finding out that they had self-managed an abortion. But there was a really high level of satisfaction. So 97% said they knew how to use the pill, 98% said they knew how to identify complications, there were some concerns around sort of they were worried about taking the pills, some of them had trouble finding money to buy them, but overall, 99% said they were satisfied and that they made the right choice. But about a third did say that they would have preferred to have a clinically supported abortion. So I think there's a lot of high levels of information of satisfaction, but not everyone is wanting to use this service who is using it. So I'm just going to tell you where we're going next with all of this is 
We're going to keep running our pilot data a little further. We're trying to think about how to get data from people who aren't using medication abortion to self-manage, who are using those unsafe methods and their experiences seeking care, because I think that's the hardest to reach segment of this population. We're going to have a survey of the providers who are providing self-managed abortion services. Um, and our plan is to, in 2025, have a national survey using this medication abortion adopted AICM and to rerun the monthly abortion provision study I talked about and try to put those two pieces together. So that's where we're going is by 2025 to put both of these pieces together to try to estimate national abortion incidents in the US. I'll leave with thanking our funder, the National Institute of Health. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to turn this over to Geraldine, who has about, she says she's going to take five minutes and then we'll open it up to the questions. And for those who are online, they can also type in their questions. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, that's being uh, Valentin, but uh, I will speak uh, hopefully on her behalf. Uh, yeah. have, uh, I have some notes and I added a few things uh, from the, the talk. And uh, so I would like to, uh, first to thank you very, very much for this presentation. It's really uh, urgent and a big need to have such, uh, conducting such uh, research and especially in this uh, really uh, difficult context. Um, and to look at the really concrete and immediate consequences on uh, women and uh, their health is really, uh, some uh, thing which uh, is uh, very important. So, as you know, abortion is a reproductive right, a human right, and even though equal access to abortion is far from being achieved in France, the French government has very recently introduced the right in the constitution. So we are really at a different context now, but um, this reminds us that unfortunately progress in the protection of sexual and reproductive uh, rights and women empowerment is never answered. Conservative forces uh, are challenging these reproductive rights. In Europe, for instance, the previous Polish government adopted in October 2020 a law that mostly totally banished abortion, which was already restrictive, uh, very uh, since 1993. And uh, though we, it looks like the new government will provide more uh, to accessibility, and especially for medication abortion, but uh, we see that never, uh, it never ensues. And of course, uh, the case of the USA, you just saw, uh, we, which has major implication for American women, but also outside of the country, because uh, American uh, uh, give a lot in, in impact a lot in the international development agenda uh, related to the sexual and reproductive rights from policy to funding and so on. So it's very, uh, uh, it uh, uh, has also global impact. Um, and uh, if we look to the, to the American context and what you have seen is uh, what you have uh, shown here, it looks like uh, impact is even larger than the banish uh, law. So for instance, in, in, um, in some states, uh, the restriction is only the two last week, like from 14 to 12, mm -hmm. but the reduction of abortion is even uh, higher than what we could expect. So this is surprising. And on the other side, you see that in other states that uh, they did not banish, the increase is much larger than the women who came from some other states. So this is very surprising to see this uh, such impact that has a lot of mixed effects and which is uh, that they are difficult to, to distinguish uh, from one to from uh, another one. Um, so it, in addition, abortion restriction is also in fact a part of a continuum of limitations on sexual and reproductive rights. It comes from uh, uh, different things like uh, in the global uh, rights, there is also uh, restriction in the access to sex education at school and contraceptive is subject to parental consent in a growing number of states. So it's also uh, included in a global context of restriction in this uh, right. Um, employers can also object to contraception being reimbursed by the employer's health insurance schemes and so on. So there is a work you mentioned by Valentin uh, from Cecil Poké Mokoko, I refer to, uh, to you to, to speak about this. Finally, women are not equal to unfavorable consequences. Like you, uh, you have uh, uh, seen the last uh, graph about uh, differences in the socioeconomic background of these women. Uh, uh, Ginsburg and Rapp introduced the concept of stratified reproduction to explicitly 
that it is always the most precarious and racialized people who have the most difficulties to find alternative access to abortion. So this is clear from the data on self-financial abortion. So conducting uh, such research project is urgent uh, again. And uh, we, see, we can see, you can show that to what extent this restriction deteriorates a woman's health, uh, physical and mental, life condition, and finally, the society as a whole. Uh, so, um, Valentin had a few questions for you. So, first was uh, the figure shows that there is a clear increase in abortion in states, bordering states where abortion is prohibited, as people wishing to have an abortion travel to these states. And in a, on the other side, you mentioned that there is, has been an increase of the abortion in these states, the border ones, uh, but we could expect that there has been some deterioration of the condition for having the uh, abortion there because of uh, larger women came and so on, so that must lengthen the delays and increase gestational age at the time of abortion. Do you have any information about that? Uh, because uh, it would be interesting to see uh, if there is a balance between in the quality and the quality, quantity in this state. Um, <coughs> Another question is about uh, is related to the measure of abortion, which is already challenging in the not restrictive settings, <laughs> and you are also you are well aware about in restrictive settings, and you are quite both a context that mixed uh, both things. So the um, adapted uh, method you presented does indeed seem promising, especially its adaptation. Could you imagine adapting? It to other contexts where abortion is illegal and where associations like women on web help women to have abortions. We already try this, um, but who oh, yeah, to aim to to adapt it uh, in other contexts. And um, Valentin had a question about uh, the miscarriage uh, definition for calculating mm -hmm. abortion rights. I think mm -hmm. you mentioned already that there is a. Uh, a package in miscarriage uh, information between uh, what is really miscarriage and uh, abortion, intending uh, abortion. So is, how can you distinguish both? And I'm sure you cannot really do it, but uh, it's difficult to, to see that. And uh, I have a, a last question uh, was uh, about the changing practice that can also have uh, led in um, in the legal abortion, like maybe less medical abortion versus ch uh, chirurgical abortion, for instance, because uh, we may think that uh, the access to misoprostol and so medication can have uh, been uh, decreased because people are afraid the, uh, the women use it not for miscarriage, but for abortion. I don't know if it's mm. uh, something that can be possible. Or on the contrary, maybe women arrive in uh, emergency uh, hospital and they, they are, it's a miscarriage and maybe there is some consensus between the with the medical uh, people that they may suspect that it's an abortion but they will say okay we'll give you this and treatment and let the woman have it as their abortion we don't know about it. Yeah. what concretely can happen and um, what is the negotiation between the medical uh, staff and the woman in the in the different states, mm -hmm. and maybe also a uh, changing practice about uh, emergency contraception. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have some data about uh, and the woman reports her uh, attention to what has, can happen just uh, after the sexual intercourse to to see if they can do something like that. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have, should we ask? Are there questions from the? Um, There's one audience. question from mine. Yeah, it's up to you. Do you want us to take more questions or to answer Jeremy's question? I think we have a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. I'll answer, I'll answer yours and then we okay. can. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the first one was with the increase in abortions in border states. How might that impact quality? So, like this quantity quality question. We have the gestational age data. We just haven't had a chance to analyze it yet. So we're going to look and see sort of has, you know, how does gestational age shift for people traveling, but also people in a state. So does it take you longer to get an abortion? Because I think some people are going to see this increase in total numbers of abortions. Like they've gone up and everyone thought they were going to go down and that that's 
a story that means we've been successful in ensuring this right was maintained. But I think there's people who didn't get care, but people who got different quality care. And you hear stories of clinics and sort of anecdotes of, you know, people calling clinic to clinic to clinic, trying to find mm -hmm. them that care. There are support networks in states that are like raising funding, that are trying to find appointments. So like there's this whole infrastructure set up to try to address the quality question, but I think we don't know how sustainable it is, how much money it requires, has quality, like what is the quality of care they've still received? What does that mean for people in states who had a harder time getting an appointment in their states and maybe they had to wait four weeks and they wouldn't have had to wait before. Um, but I think one interesting thing is looking at the share of abortions done through telemedicine, it's really going up. And so if, a lot of that increases because telemedicine access has grown. Then I think that would relieve some of the burden on the clinics that, that have more limited capacity and what they can provide. So I think that's, that's a piece we're still trying to understand looking at the telemedicine data and gestational age data. Um, in to the medication abortion, AICMB used in other contexts. It's a, really, it's a really interesting question. And I think depends a little on the data that's available. Because sometimes when we've done the AICM in restrictive settings, post-abortion care by its nature, like with complications, often has to be in a health facility. So it's gonna, it's gonna show up in your hospitals, your district hospitals, and you can go and collect data there. If it's treatment seeking to confirm you're no longer pregnant, it could just be your doctor's office. And it's really hard to get a national sample of physician offices in some countries. So I think it would depend on what data was available on the facilities and the types of providers and where people were seeking care for that type of service. And, and that will vary country by country. In the US, so this is where we're really looking at the health administrative data and about half of people look like they're going to clinics, not private doctor's offices, which helps a lot. And there are more private doctor's offices included in some of the electronic health record data and other data sources that we don't have as much in, in lower income settings. Um, so I think it's, we want to explore it, but the facility, just being able to do a comprehensive facility sample will be a challenge. Um, the miscarriage management care piece is one we've thought a lot, like we use that, it's funny, globally people say post-abortion care, and that includes miscarriages and abortion. And in the U.S. they say miscarriage care, and it includes abortion and miscarriages. So we're just using different terms. We should, you should be able to see some miscarriages and abortions using like ICD-10 codes, which would tell you sort of what are, like, they're supposed to be classified differently, but we think that a provider is going to have different incentives to classify things differently. And so what we're, our thought is to take the maximum sort of potential ways that a miscarriage or an abortion could be coded and then look at that trend data and try to pick up the increase in that because there's going to be so much misclassification of cases to protect patients who come in that they think might have had an abortion, but they don't want it to be suspected as such. Um, we're even hearing that like, you know, maybe it's not even going to get classified as one of the, the pregnancy related codes, but it might just show up as vaginal bleeding. And that's what they classified as. They don't even acknowledge it's the pregnancy related case that's being treated. And so we're thinking of sort of all the different ways this could get measured. Um, because I think, yeah, that's going to be a huge, huge part of it. And the emergency contraception piece, we don't have data in this work, but we've got colleagues who focus on family planning in the US and changes in contraceptive need and access. And I'll ask them if they've looked at changes in emergency contraception, because they've been looking at how contraceptive need and access has also been impacted by, by the Dobbs decision. Can you do just a, a question about, um, you know, if in context, uh, there are some negotiations between the staff and I, I don't know. No. I mean, I think um, often the, the self-managed abortion providers give people um, a hotline number they can call and they will coach them on what you can say in a health facility to try to make it not seem like an abortion. So I think there's a lot of effort okay. to help people feel like they can safely go to a facility and say that they've had a miscarriage. Um, There's one question online from Vidya from Nepal. I'm uncertain why some women may choose not to seek treatment with 